their their wilderness wanderings. And so, uh, Deuteronomy chapter chapter ten. If you want to want to open up there, <clears throat> I'll I'll go back to verse twenty eight of chapter nine just by way of rehash. And uh, uh, how was uh, how was Sunday morning? Kind of weird. Is that kind of weird? Different. You can say weird. It's okay. I said it. It's kind of weird, huh? Did it, did it glitch pretty bad? Yeah, my uh, my internet connection is is not so hot out there. So I come walking past my mom and dad. They live about thirty miles from town. I come walking past their their fuse box on the pole, just outside their house, and there's this little black thing on the bottom of it, which I later found out is a surge protector. And it's like melted and dripping down. It's like, you know, and uh, I come walking by there and I look at that. And so I take a picture of it and I go inside and there in a little bit I run into dad and I said, uh, hey, have you seen this? Oh yeah, I need to get a new one, <laughs> a new one of those. So they're on the end of the electric line and their electricity is very sketchy. Their, their internet, it's, it's out in the Thule's. So uh, anyway, uh, so it's kind of weird. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Let's read verse 28 and 9 of chapter 9. Lest the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. This is Moses' defense as he's interceding on behalf of the people. And he's telling God, he's saying, don't do this. Don't destroy the people because people are going to say you weren't able to fulfill your promises. And Moses knows that's not the truth. Everybody knows that's not the truth. Verse 29, he says, Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. At that time, the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. So, so at, at Moses rehashing what's happened, he says, God told him, because the first two, what happened to them? Well, Moses, he threw them down and broke them, right? So God says, okay, we're going to do this again. This time you cut them out. So Moses has to go and he's got to cut out these two tables and he's supposed to bring them up. And he is instructed there to make an ark of wood. Verse 2, And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood. Who made the ark? Bezalel and Aholiah made the ark. Right? Well, that's not what that says. Moses said he made the ark. Wait a minute. Hold up. Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 10. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So did they make it? Or did Moses make it? Exodus chapter 37. And verse 1. And Bezalel made the ark of Shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without. Not Leah helped it. Hang, hang on. Who made the ark? There's two arks. Two arks. Moses made one. Bezalel made one. Moses made a very simple one out of shittim wood. Bezalel made a really, really fancy one that he overlaid with gold. And so as you carefully read the Bible, this is one of those places that people love to go to and say, aha, contradiction in the Word of God. But it's not. There were actually two arcs, okay? Um, there, there are other situations like this as well that you'll find that there's, there's more, for instance, there's more than one tent of meeting. 
There's the tabernacle, but there was also another one that, that Moses made earlier than the tabernacle that he used. And then there's another one that David made as a temporary shelter until the, uh, uh, the temple itself could be constructed. So Moses builds a simple ark. He says, I'm making, I've made an ark of shittim wood, you two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. Man, wouldn't that be something? I, I, I just, I, every time I read that, I just think, I wonder what that looked like. I wonder if, if like a laser came out of God's finger and he, you know, etched it with a laser. Or maybe, maybe his finger just was like a graving tool and he just, or maybe he chiseled it, bang, bang, bang. I just don't know. Maybe it's sandblasted in, you know. I, 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 God wrote him with his finger. Um, it's interesting to me, the only things that God himself wrote I mean, the rest of this word that we hold on to and hold so dear is not written by God himself. It's inspired by God. It's God breathed. It's preserved by God. But holy men of God are moved by the Holy Ghost and they bend it. Outside of the Ten Commandments, can you think of any other writing that God himself did? Remember the woman caught in adultery? Jesus knelt down, used his finger, and wrote on the ground. And the Bible doesn't even tell us exactly what he wrote when he wrote those things. He could have done this again. He could have started writing out the Ten Commandments on the ground. That maybe is what he did. But it's interesting to me that, that God moved men to write the Bible rather than writing it himself, except for these two instances. Oh, one more, and it may not be God's hand, but... The hand that showed up in the time of Daniel and wrote on the wall, "Mini, mini, tinkle, you parson." I don't know whose hand that was. So, so possibly that's another one. Nonetheless, verse five says, "And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be as the Lord commanded me." And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth of the children of Jacob to Moserah, and there Aaron died. Aaron died at Moserah. No. Aaron died on Mount Hor. Where did Aaron die? Did he die at Masara or did he die on Mount Hor? Because Numbers tells us he died on Mount Hor. Deuteronomy says it was at a place called Masara. Well, that one's easy to reconcile. Mount Hor is a mount in the area of Masara, which is on the border of Edom. You can see Edom from that particular place. And so, so that's where Aaron died. And he says, and there he was buried. And Eleazar, his son, ministered in the priest's office in his stead. And so you remember the, the story of uh, Moses, Aaron, and Eleazar go up on the hill and, and uh, on the mountain. And, and, and Moses, he takes the priestly garments off of Aaron. He puts them on Eleazar. And then Aaron, he went over there and laid down and, and he died because of the same situation as Moses. Verse 7, from thence they journeyed unto Good Godah, and from Good Godah to Jokbath, a land of rivers of waters. And so if you were to go back and go to the book of Numbers, you'll see there a list of all of their wilderness travels. And they, they're going to back up and move during that 40-year period about 40 times. So they move just about, on average, once a year. Um, I think maybe it's 42 or something like that. So they, they, they average a little better than once a year during that period of time that, that God's Shekinah glory would, the, the pillar would begin to, to, the cloud would rise up and when it did, well, the people were to, to break camp and they were to follow until the pillar stopped and then they were to strike camp again. And, and, and so uh, you can see that taking place and Moses is rehashing part of this. And verse eight, he says, at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi. And, and he tells us, you know, what their, uh, what their job was, okay? So, so, so what God's going to do is He's going to require, if you remember in the book of Exodus, He says that every firstborn son belongs to God. And, and so what God is saying is, is that the firstborn son, just like the firstborn of everything, 
it belongs to God. So you you give the firstborn to God, and then you keep the rest after that, unless it's a part of a tithe or something like that. The first fruits belong to God. Well, also the firstborn son belongs to God. And it's part of the reason why he took the firstborn sons from the Egyptians. Um, that's that's that was his his judgment there in Egypt. So what God does at this point in time is, is he makes a, a makes a swap. Instead of the priestly caste being made up of firstborn sons, what God does is he makes a swap and he trades the entire tribe of Levi for all the rest of the firstborn sons of the rest of the Israelites. So from this point in time on right here, God sets up a representative form of government. Instead of sending the firstborn son from your family to go and be a priest, you redeem your firstborn son, and God takes the Levites. And if you remember in the book of Numbers, when they did this, they took a census of the Levites, and they took a census of all the tribes of Israel, and they found out that the Levites were a little bit shy. They didn't quite have enough to cover all of the the, the men, or the firstborn sons within the Israelites. And so they had to pay some money. And once they paid that money, that squared them up. God took the tribe of Levi, and from that point in time on, that's the priestly tribe, uh, the tribe of Levi. And they're going to be very different in the way that they uh, that they operate. And so he says, at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to do these things. Number one, to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. How were they supposed to move the ark? And two staves run through it, and the particular descendants of Aaron or the particular tribe of the Levites, the Kohathites, I believe it was, they were to be the ones who bore the ark. And that was the way it was to be carried. Nobody else was to touch it. Nobody else was to come near it. And they weren't even, they weren't even actually to touch the ark. The priests came in, and they put the, made sure the staves were right, and they draped the ark with a, a, a cloth so that you couldn't even see it. And then they picked it up, bear it on their shoulders, and they were to carry it. David's going to learn the hard way not to use Philistine technology to transport the ark on an ox cart. But that was one of their jobs. First of all, to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Number two, to stand before the Lord to minister unto him. That was the second part of the job, the work of the Levites, was to stand before the Lord. So the Levites... They took turns cycling through the temple uh, or the tabernacle, depending on what stage of, of Israel they were in. And they were the ones who stood to minister before the Lord. They handled the sacrifices. They made way for the priests. They helped the priests. They gathered the wood. They moved the ashes. They, they set up the, the tents and the tabernacles and all of those kind of things that took place there. And then number three, to bless in his name unto this day. Do you remember the book of Numbers, chapter 6, I believe, at the end of the chapter? Uh, there is the Aaronic blessing that Aaron would give. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you, lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And so, so they were to be the ones who pronounced the blessings upon the children of Israel. The priest is going to come from Levi, uh, but they are going to be the descendants of Aaron. The rest of the Levites are not priests. You've got priests but then you've got a whole priestly tribe, and it's representative. They represent the tribe, or the, the entire nation of Israel, one tribe does. Uh, verse 9, Wherefore Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. So he's reminding them that Levi is not going to get a parcel of land in the land of Israel the way that Judah or Manasseh or Ephraim or the other tribes are going to get. Now, they are going to get a bunch of cities, six of which are cities of refuge. There's going to be, I think, 38 different Levitical cities that they will receive. They also get the suburbs around those particular cities, so they can have a victory garden and a, and a handful of sheep or goats or whatever uh, in those areas. But those cities are scattered. And think about it. If you want your priestly tribe, how do you want them to, if they're going to do these things, they're going to bear the ark. There's going to be times they need to be in Jerusalem ministering at the temple because it's their turn to bear the ark. But there's also going to be times that they're blessing in his name. And that means that they're scattered. And as we work our way through, one of the things you see, and they don't do a very good job of it, but really their job is to be teaching the law of God to the people. 
That's what they're supposed to be doing. And it's part of the reason why they're scattered around. They're also the places where these cities of refuge are. And so they're going to play a pretty big role in judicial matters as well. They're not necessarily the judges, but it's in these cities of refuge that the Levites are stationed. And there's large concentrations of Levitical families in those particular areas. So you can see how God does this, how he designs this situation. <clears throat> he says the. He says, they have no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance. Now remember what we read at the end of chapter 9. Israel is the Lord's inheritance. And the Lord is the Levite's inheritance. And if you just sit down and think about that for a minute, and think about what God told Abraham. God told Abraham, he said, walk before me. I am your exceeding great reward. You know, men strive for reward in this life. They strive for achievement, accomplishment, for wealth, for um, ideas, for power, uh, for money. They, they, they strive for all kinds of things. One of the things that you see is that holy men and women are called to all throughout the Bible is to recognize that the, the true inheritance is a relationship with God. And a true reward is to know God. And that is what we should be striving for. We should be striving for that above all else and trusting God to provide the things that we need. Because at the end of your life, and it's really funny how most people have, a, it takes a lifetime to learn this. But you can't take it with you, can you? And so... The next thing that a person says is, is, well, I can hand it down. And you can. You can hand it down. But they can't take it with them. Maybe they can hand it down. But I'll tell you a really sad story about a ranch south of here. Great big one. Really big one. At one point in time, it was owned by one family. Now it's whittled into so many different little pieces and parcels and sections that it's unrecognizable at this particular point. And so even in trying to, to hand down this massive inheritance that some people have spent so much time, energy, and effort amassing, even in that, you can't trust your descendants to do what you want for them to do with your stuff, right? And so, so I, I love what he says here. He says, for the Levites, the Lord... Is their inheritance and that should be the same for us as well hey inheritance are, are a gift from fathers grandfathers grandmothers that's great but what we really ought to be looking for what we really ought to be building our life on is the inheritance of knowing God and of walking with God and passing down a godly heritage to the next generation and make that the most important thing rather than passing down a bunch of money or wealth and, uh, and so he says there, uh, uh, according as the Lord thy God promised him, verse 10, and I stayed in the mount according to the first time, 40 days and 40 nights. So let's see, we're at the end of Ju July. So that means all of August, and that's about 30 days, and then 10 days into, so we're, we're a, about a week and a half past Labor Day. So anybody want to skip eating from now until... September the 9th or 10th. Anybody want to take a shot at that? No? Me neither. Moses did it twice back to back. 40 day fast, no food, no water, came down, broke the Ten Commandments, went over there. You know, it's impressive just the fact that he actually had the strength to chip out the new ones. You know, he had to go there, take a hammer and chisel, making two new tablets. I bet he was tuckered out by the time he got back to the top of that mountain. Hadn't eaten in 40 days or 40 nights, but his face was shining. He was glowing because he'd been in the presence of Almighty God, and it was so apparent that the people had to, he had to wear a veil over his face like a woman would do because it freaked the people out so much because his face was glowing. So, obviously, Moses is drawing his sustenance from God. Obviously, God is supernaturally uh, um, protecting him. He is supernaturally uh, providing for him during this period of time, okay? So he says, he says, uh, and the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord would not destroy thee. Now, 
that says that God listened to Moses. So chapters 9 and 10, Moses is telling this whole story. These chapters really go together. So if you remember back in chapter 9, he said there that he was going to destroy. God told Moses, he says, those people that are your people down there, they have already made an idol and they have blasphemed my name. So leave me alone now and I'm going to smash them. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to take you. I'm going to start over and I'm going to build a, a group of people that will honor me. And Moses fell on his face before the Lord and he begged the Lord. He said, please don't do this because your enemies will say you couldn't fulfill your promises. Um, it, it, will, it will look bad on your holy and righteous name and just, just, just don't do it. For your sake, don't do this. Moses didn't appeal to him saying, oh, please don't do this. These poor people, they don't deserve this. Moses never said that. He said, no, no, they deserve it. We all deserve it. It's not about whether we deserve God's goodness or not, because we don't. It's about God's promise. It's about God's covenant. It's about God's holy name. It's about God's nature. It's about, it's about that aspect of God's character. And that's what Moses appealed to. Okay, So that's what he's talking about again. And it makes me think. I highlighted in my Bible verse 10. Now I want you to think about it. The first fast was called Moses up to the top of the mountain. And I don't think Moses thought about food at that point in time. He, he heard God call him to approach. He approached. God handed him these tablets. They convened and conversed for 40 days with each other. He invited the, the 70 elders and Aaron up there to have this conversation. If you really look hard at that, Moses is up and down the mountain several times during that period of time. Okay, And as he's doing that, he is... He's, I don't know, it doesn't tell us. Jesus at the end of his 40-day fast says he was hungry. It doesn't tell us whether Moses was hungry or not. So I don't know. I'm thinking I'd be hungry, even if I was in God's presence, but whatever. The second 40 days is different, though. The second 40 days is punitive. God is going to punish the children of Israel. God is upset with the children. He is angry with them because of what they've done. And Moses approaches to God, comes back to him with these tablets that he's made. And I, I, I can't help but think that that second 40-day fast doesn't have to do with a, a majority of that period of time. Moses interceding on behalf of the people. And that reminds me of Matthew chapter 17. So let's turn there real quick. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14. This is the, um, it's, it's a, a, a different situation, but they're up on top of the mountain. Jesus with Peter, James, and John. They come down from the top of the mountain. They see him transfigured there before them. They come down and they find a, a demon-possessed situation down in the valley. And so verse 14, it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. It's almost as if Jesus is a little bit upset the way he says that, isn't it? And he calls them a faithless and a perverse generation. He says, and Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Because they had been trying. The whole time Jesus was up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, the rest of the disciples have been trying to cast this demon out of this child. And they have had success in casting demons out of people prior to this. And they're confused. We tried, Lord. Why couldn't we do it? Verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say to you, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible to you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And I just, I, I, I'm reminded of that as I read through this, and it just makes me wonder, I don't know that all of our intercession is with the same intensity. Because I'm thinking that 
second 40 days was pretty intense for Moses. 80 days without eating. Begging God. I mean, he, what he could have done is he could have said, okay, God, wipe them out. Don't get any on me. I didn't, I didn't do it, right? You know? I mean, you ever been in one of those deals and your brothers or sisters, they do something and they're getting in trouble for it and you're like, what me? Well, he could have done that, but he doesn't. He intercedes on their behalf. He intercedes to the point that that he he's, he says, and during that time, God hearkened unto me. Isaiah tells us that the fast God calls us to is to make our voice heard on high. And and I just I just bring that up because I have to be one hundred percent honest with you. I am not a good faster. I'm, I'm not good at that. I certainly would never do it for health reasons ever under any circumstances. Uh, I've been forced into it a time or two because I had to have a blood test done or something like that. Don't need anything after midnight. I felt sorry for the puppy the other day. She couldn't have anything after 10 o'clock before she got spayed. I felt terrible for her. I wanted to feed her at midnight, you know, just to break the rules. I mean, telling somebody to go without food is like, that's uncool to me. I have fasted. I'm not going to tell you about it because I'd lose all my reward. But I have fasted. I read about fasts in Scripture. I've got books on fasting at the house. Most of them are very unimpressive to me because they turn it into this work. Um, and so I, I, really, I really think that kind of misses the point. Um, <clears throat> throughout history, you know, uh, fasts on Friday uh, from meat have been imposed by Anglicans as well as Roman Catholics and all kinds of imposed fasts and different things. I've seen the Muslim world during Ramadan and it's the most hypocritical thing I've ever seen in my life because they fast during the day and then they're just, they just walk around just oh, act like they're going to die and as soon as the sun goes down then they just go chow down. And... But a real fast. A fast where you are Desperate for God to hear you. Desperate to talk to the Lord. A fast where you are so concerned for somebody else, not for yourself. You're not thinking about yourself during that period of time. A, 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 a situation where there's a sick child or a situation with a loved one who is, is, is in dire situation. I mean, a deal where... You know, unless something, unless God does a miracle in this situation, I don't know how we're going to get through this. And, and when you get put in a situation like that, when you really love God, when you really know God, all of a sudden food just doesn't seem all that important at that point in time. And I think that is the fast that God calls us to. I don't think it's planned per se. Oh, it could be, but I mean, think about some of these fasts, you know. Um, Daniel. Daniel was desperate to hear from God. He fasted for three weeks because he was desperately trying to, to understand what God's plan was and what God was doing. Uh, Ezra. Ezra pops off and says, hey, we don't need the king's protection and his sheriff to, you know, to, you know help us to go. We don't need his soldiers. God will protect us. And then he gets to thinking about it. He's like, well, I do believe that God will protect us, but gosh, it's a dangerous journey. We better fast and pray about this. Esther, she was in a desperate situation when she told Mordecai that, you know, to call for, for fasting on her behalf. You know, you, you, you see these through Scripture, and I think that's what the, the, the situation with the disciples were. They thought they were just going to walk in just like they'd done in the past, just... Get out of him, demon. And when that didn't happen, then they begin to lose faith and they didn't know what to do. And Jesus rebuked them for your lack of faith. He's like, look, you want to you get rid of this kind of a demon, this kind of, of infestation within a human life? You've got to get desperate. you got to, I mean, you've got you to fast and pray. He'd been up on the mountain fasting, talking to the Father, being transfigured, communicating with Moses and Elijah. Comes walking down, he's ready. He'd been in, he'd been in that, that situation and, and he's able to, to do that. I'm not saying the two are exactly alike, but it, I can't help but, but think as I read that about Moses that, that the disciples 
were in, in a similar situation. They just weren't desperate enough. Uh, and they just weren't in, intense enough. And that's, you know, sometimes that's what intercession is. A desperate, intense situation where you just really kind of forget about everything else, including feeding your body, because you just have to get through to God. And, um, and I think that may be where Moses was. Verse 11, the Lord said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of thee? What's that remind you of? Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, doesn't it? Sounds very similar. It's kind of interesting, he, the, the, the way it's phrased. He says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God. To walk in all his ways and to love him. And to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. No big deal. What's God required of you? 100% absolute, complete, total obedience and love and devotion. No problem. How are they doing? Not so good. <laughs> their love was divided. Their devotion was divided. Their attention span was about... Uh, about that long, you know, they're like, oh, God, you're so great. Oh, look, squirrel, you know, they they just had a really hard time staying focused, it seems. And so he says uh, um, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. That's that's the other thing that, that, that I think it's important for Christians to realize is that is that God's word is given to us for our good. Um, God doesn't make arbitrary rules. He doesn't, he doesn't make dumb rules. Some people may disagree with me on this, but I once knew a guy and his dad would give him work to do <clears throat> that was meaningless. And I, I, always, I always had a huge problem with that. His dad would tell him, go out in the yard and dig a pit that's three feet wide, four feet long, and two feet deep. He'd give him a shovel, away he'd go. He'd come back that afternoon, he'd go out there and look at it. And then he'd go measure it. Oh, okay. Now fill it in. There was no purpose for it. It wasn't like he was digging his own grave or a swimming pool or something like that that could actually serve a purpose. He just gave him dumb work to do. Well, I think that's what some people think about God's Word, but, but it's not the case. God doesn't just make arbitrary rules. God's law, God's Word, is given to us for our good. Not only is this righteousness but it's also goodness to to love God and to love his word you know when you when you take those ten commandments you look at them the reason God says to love him above all else is because he's worthy above all else you put something before God and your priorities are completely out of whack uh, the reason that God says don't steal is because well if you can't if you can't value private property, then what do you have? You've got an anarchist situation. Oh, wait. We, we have a situation going on in our nation just like that right now. With people saying, oh, they're not stealing. They're not there. This is a season of love as they're burning the city to the ground. And nobody's supposed to be upset about that. You should be very upset about that. Those people are destroying, they're violent, they're filled with hate, and they should be stopped. Uh, you know, God values private property. God values human life, and you should too. And I should too. We, we should value human life. Thou should not kill. You shouldn't take human life lightly. And so, so as you look at all of God's, God's Word, what you see is, is you see that it's given for our good. Okay? And he says there in verse 14, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also and all that therein is. So never forget that. Even though Satan is in the New Testament called the God of this world and the world lies in the power of evil, never forget that God owns it all. Satan is like a junkyard dog and God has given him a certain amount of chain. But once he hits the end of that chain, that's all that he's got. That God is the eternal. All in all, he owns it all. Okay? And so... He says in verse 15, Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you, above all people, as it is this day. So we, we talked about this in chapter 7, again in chapter 8. 
God didn't choose Israel because they were more righteous, because they were bigger, because they were smarter, because they didn't, it had nothing to do with their inherent value. It had everything to do with God's choosing. God chose Abraham. And that, <coughs> excuse me, is what election is all about. Election is God chooses. How do I come to God? I come to God in the way God chooses. That's how I come to God. How is God chosen? God chose Christ. And I can come to God through Christ, through faith in Christ. I can't come to him any other way. Say, oh, well, these people, they have this religion. These people have that religion. Well, they may have that, but that's not God's choice. That's not the way that God has chosen. And just like Pharaoh, all Pharaoh would have had to have done is to have acknowledged, you're God. You've chosen these people. Okay. I, I believe you. What, do you. what do you want me to do? Other kings are going to do that. <laughs> you know? But not Pharaoh. And, and so, so what we see is, is, is he says, hey, this is my choice. This is the way that I'm going to do it. And so he calls them. He says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Stiff-necked and hard-hearted. That's the, 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 the accusation that's brought against is the Israelites. Stiff-necked and hard-hearted. And God uses an illustration here in His Word. You remember He gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, which is a fleshly surgical procedure per performed on an eight-day-old boy. Okay? And so all Israelites know what He's talking about here. But now He takes it and He uses it in a way that, that is spiritual your heart is proud <laughs> it's it's proud before god you need to circumcise the foreskin of your heart he says you need to humble yourself before god you need to stop being so stiff-necked before almighty god and he says in verse 17, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and a Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. What does it mean that God regardeth not persons? Well, <clears throat> it means that God is not a racist. It means that God does not give preferential treatment to one person over another because of anything inherent to them. Because of their money, their skill, their talent, their ability, any of that. It means that God treats all people the same. He, he doesn't regard persons. God is not impressed by someone's ability, talent, money, wealth, whatever. Matter of fact, think about it. What was the one thing that Jesus brought up the most often that he was almost shocked when he found in a person in Israel. What was it that he would, on multiple occasions, I haven't seen such great faith. Didn't matter where they were from, the Syrophoenician woman. He said, that's faith right there. Remember that? He said, he said, I can't help you. I was sent to Israel. I didn't come to help the dogs. That would have offended most people, not hers. He said, yeah, but even the little dogs, they eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he said, wow, faith. That's what God's looking for. So he doesn't regard persons. He does not take a reward. You can't bribe God. You can't pay for the stained glass in your church windows and let that get you off the hook because you uh, uh, are having an adulterous affair. Uh, you can't throw some money in the offering plate and think that somehow that's going to bribe God. That doesn't work. People try it all the time, but it doesn't work. And he says, he says, he execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow. Two groups that all throughout scripture, matter of fact, James tells us this is what pure and undefiled religion is. If you want to talk about religion, religion is this. Take care of the fatherless and the widow. And he loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. God teaches the Israelites, you, you were a stranger in the land of Egypt. You need, to, you need to be hospitable to strangers. If you've never read it, let me recommend an interesting read. And it's not a Christian village that does this. But uh, Marcus Luttrell's book. Don't go watch the movie. It's terrible. But read the book. Um, 
What's, What's it called? I can't remember. I'll think of it here in a minute. Anyway, uh, Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor is the name of the book. There's some terrible language in it, so I don't recommend that. You've got to skip over those parts, but it's written by a Navy SEAL. So, But when he escapes, he's the only one of his SEAL team that escapes from the Taliban, and he is found out by this, this Muslim village. And they take him in, nurse him back to health. He hides his rifle. So he, he, he doesn't want to be viewed as a combatant. And he kind of tells a little bit of a fib as to why he's there. I think they knew. But it's not long until the Taliban find out that he's in this village. That village protected that man because he was a stranger. And because he was a wayfaring man. And they had, one of the men of that village had taken him into his home. And he had fed him. His family had nursed him back to health. He had, he, had, he had vowed to protect him. And that village would have fought to the death against the Taliban to protect that man because their religious conviction to take care of the stranger was so great. And as I read that book, I thought, you know, that's, that's kind of what God calls us to as well. We're supposed to we're supposed to take care of the stranger. We're supposed to we're supposed to look after the widow, the orphan. And when you look at Hebrews 13, it says that we that some people when they entertain strangers, they were actually entertaining angels unaware. And that's exactly what happened with Abraham whenever God and the the, the travelers show up at his house. So um, so he tells them this is what you're supposed to do. Verse 20, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. Cleave, same word used in Genesis to talk of marriage. You hang on to God, attach yourself to God, and don't let go. Verse 21, he is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Let me just, just point out, uh, the threescore and ten persons is really interesting. You should, uh, you should look at that. Genesis chapter 10 is the table of nations, and you'll see there that when God breaks down all the nations, there are actually 70 of them. And so there were 70 people counted that went down to Egypt. But Stephen says there were 75. And so once again, that happens in Acts chapter 7. We have a contradiction in Scripture, right? Well, if you go back and you look at the lists in Genesis 46 and in uh, Deuteronomy 10 and then uh, again in uh, Deuteronomy 38, and then you look at Acts 7 and you look at all those lists. It's going gonna, it's gonna to enumerate who it was that actually went down into Egypt. And what you find is that Stephen gives the number as 75. There are five women that Stephen is counting that don't get counted in the other count. And if you take a look at that and you, you carefully look at those things. God, God plays with numbers sometimes, you know. Uh, there's 12 tribes of Israel, but every time you see those 12 tribes listed, they're always listed differently. And uh, part of the reason for that is, is that Joseph gets a, a double portion. So Manasseh and Ephraim are counted as children of Jacob, but it's actually Joseph. And so God can give the list and list all of the, 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 the 12, or he can give the list and leave out Dan and list Ephraim and Manasseh, or God can leave out Levi and he can, you know, he does it, he does it different almost every single time. And so, so I, just, I just want to point that out to you. That's something that's fun and interesting to take a look at. And, uh, and ponder as you, uh, as you study uh, the Bible. But the point is, 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 hey, you came down there with 70 of you, and when you left, it was millions. Uh, God is multiplying Israel, blessing Israel, and uh, heaping upon Israel His promises and blessings, just like He said that He would. Let's pray together. Father, we just love you. We thank you for this time together tonight. And Father, as we as we're just reminded of Moses' intercession, of his his um, Lord, his love for you, his reverence of you, 
which drove him to intercede on behalf of the Israelite people, calling uh, uh, for your mercy, Lord, and begging you for that, and pointing out, Lord, your great name, your mighty and terrible power, your, your character, Lord, that is impeccable, the fact that you don't regard persons or take bribes like some petty chieftain. But God, you are the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the King of kings, and we praise you tonight. Lord Jesus, we... Uh, we just stand in awe of you as we consider how good you are to us, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you and we praise you. And Father, we just pray that you would continue to remind us of the ministry of intercession. Father, as we look around and we see people that are lost, that need the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to invade their lives, that need your Holy Spirit to bring conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment, Father, Lead us to that kind of intersection, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to take fasting and make it into something about us, but, Lord, that, that we might love you and love others enough to, to allow you to lead us to the fast that you call us to. Father, we just love you. We praise you. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity we have together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm glad you're here.